Who knows, Esther? Perhaps you have come into your royal position for just such a time as this. What kind of time was that? Again, the book of Esther is set in the Persian Empire, roughly 480 B.C. As you may remember from previous sermons, about 100 years before that, the reigning global superpower, Babylonia, had sent its military forces into Jerusalem and and raised the temple, raised the city, raised people's homes to the ground and took many of its inhabitants into exile and displaced them throughout the vast empire. Many of the biblical prophets lived and offered their judgment, their hope, their their voice of direction during that time of upheaval and, and uncertainty and death. But half a century later, 50 years later, after that moment, Persia arose as the new superpower and defeated Babylonia. So the book of Esther is set during the reign of the great Persian king Xerxes I, named here as King Ahasuerus, whose empire was said to have extended from India in the east to the Mediterranean region over to the likes of Italy to Rome, down into Africa to Ethiopia. It's written by a displaced minority amidst a world empire, perhaps not unlike a a refugee writing in the context of America today. The story of Esther represents a vision for how we live, how we can live faithfully in exile, away from home, amidst times of great upheaval and uncertainty and death. Now, Esther herself was a poor orphaned girl being raised by her uncle Mordecai, both tracing their history back to those Jews who were displaced after war with Babylonia, the family brought there in chains. When King Xerxes decides to depose his current queen, as the story goes and tells us before this moment, Depose of her, Vashti, because she was too disobedient for his taste. Well, so he sent agents throughout the empire, throughout the kingdom, looking for the most beautiful and obedient young woman to replace her. And against all odds, Esther finds herself becoming the protagonist in this Cinderella-like story as the king chooses her to become queen. But the honeymoon, as I mentioned before the sermon, doesn't last long because Mordecai repeatedly refuses to bow to to Haman, the king's top advisor. He refuses to pledge his allegiance to their unjust rule. And so in a fit of egotistical rage, Haman issues a decree on behalf of the king to have all Jews, young and old, women and children, all Jews, from every province of the empire annihilated and their goods plundered. Right? That'll teach a lesson who anyone who dared disobey, disobey or stand up to the crown. Right? Again, living in a post-Holocaust world, in a, in a world where people of minority religions and cultures are being ethnically cleansed to this day, such a decree and the ideology around it are no hyperbole. It's always there, nascent and waiting to be released. Our scripture reading this morning again picks up with Mordecai learning of this decree, of him falling on his knees and wailing in lament, in grief for the seemingly inevitable destruction that is to come. Right now, Esther is disturbed by her uncle's public display, his, his protest at the king's gate. It's a, it's a bad look for her as the queen. And so she, she tries to get him to knock it off. She sends him some clothes, asks him to change and get himself together. But, but Esther has actually yet to, to hear the news herself. The reason that Mordecai is so distraught. And so Mordecai sends her the news, pleading with her to use her position as the queen to influence the king to change his mind, to change the future. 
And in that moment, she has to grapple with what, what will this dutiful daughter do? But I can imagine her pacing back and forth, feeling the tensions, the complexities, the fears of that moment. All right, thus far, she's kept her Jewish identity a secret. The, the king doesn't know her ethnicity or background, but if she does, as Mordecai asks, well, she'll be exposed, and she's just as likely to die as everybody else. Right? What good is that? Perhaps she rationalizes if she just stays silent. At least she'll be safe. And so she tells Mordecai, you know I can't do what you've asked. No one is allowed to go to the king unsummoned, lest they be put to death. And I haven't been summoned by the king for a month. You think I can just show up and make a request like this, go against his top advisor and live? But Mordecai refuses to let her off the hook. Do not think that that just because you're in the king's household, you alone of all the Jews will escape, Esther. If you choose to stay silent at such a time as this, God will work through someone and somewhere else, but you will still perish. Can you not see that against all odds, perhaps God has placed you here now for just such a time as this? The question that Mordecai puts before Esther is, will you remain silent and allow others to suffer in order to protect yourself? Will you simply maintain your your comfort and privilege at the expense of others? Who will you align your, your life, your destiny with, Esther, the rich and powerful or those whose lives are at stake? In that moment, the the voices of fear and uncertainty that had been screaming in Esther's mind are silenced because she knows deep down what she must do, that she must act as a vessel for the God who wills life, even as so much remains uncertain, including her own future. Go, she says to Mordecai, (sighs) gather the others. Fast and pray, and I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. It's a powerful moment, capturing the powerful transformation of this seemingly innocent, obedient girl who has now come into her own, who now risks her own life to defy her her husband and king. Talk about the courage to do what's necessary and right. The story of Esther is, is a reminder that even as history is filled with kings like Xerxes and rulers like Haman, so it has always been filled with people like Mordecai and Esther. Pick your era your part of the world, your time of great instability or uncertainty and violence, and you will always find Esther's and Mordecai's. Like Esther, no one asks to be put in such a position. Unlike King Xerxes and Haman, theirs is not an ego-filled pursuit of power, of, of prestige, of puffing themselves up. It is simply the courage to respond in the face of one's fears and amidst the uncertainty to the needs of one's time and place. Sometimes this looks more dramatic than others, like those who risked their lives to save Jews under Nazism or or those who gave themselves to be part of the Underground Railroad. But always we are called to respond. As Dr. King put it amidst the upheaval and violence of the 60s and the civil rights movement, the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that. 
by the good people. The time is always right, he said, to do what is right. Too often, as individuals, we allow ourselves to shrink. We use God to justify our playing small, and our churches do the same. We become hyper-focused on self-preservation to the point of losing our true mission and purpose. As Esther no doubt grappled with, the easier route is to, to simply look out for ourselves, our family, our church, who's already here, and let others do the same, right? But that's the exact opposite of the invitation, the challenge that our faith places before us. Our faith invites us, it expects us to be open and, and creative, to be attuned to our neighbor's gifts and needs as we ask ourselves what God is asking of us in such a time as this. Again, this is our theme for this season, this year's season of stewardship, for such a time as this. A time, this pandemic time with so many challenges, so much need, so much fear, so much upheaval and of uncertainty. I don't, I don't need to tell you all of, all of the things, right? You know. And there are also so many churches, about 380,000 in the U.S., actually. And so why federated? Why does it matter if we are here? What difference does this community's existence make? What, what gifts, what assets, what resources, what passions, what relationships, what influence has God brought together here for such a time as this? Stewardship is a, a season to reflect on how we might be able to respond faithfully in the year ahead, what, what old things we might lay aside and what new things God might then ask us to take up, to do among and through us. And what is each of us willing to do to give to be a part of that work? I invite you to reflect on these questions in the day ahead in the days ahead. Next Sunday after worship, once again, weather pending, hopefully in the great outdoors uh, of the Judea's backyard, we'll invite you after worship into a time of small group conversation about questions like these, that, that they may inspire and guide us into this new year together. Right? This is the real priority of stewardship. The question before us in this season is not merely how can we raise enough money to, to fund our budgets or, or keep the lights on or, or pay the employees. The question is what kind of church is needed for such a time as this? And are we willing to respond like Esther to those needs? I believe we are. I believe that we can put aside petty grievances or or things that are not of ultimate concern in order to focus on the gospel and our mission because I've already seen it. We've been doing it throughout the pandemic, but the time is always right to do what is right. And so as people of God, may we continue moving forward with open hands. May we continue to be faithful stewards of the vision, of the responsibilities, of the mission that God has placed before us for our healing and joy, for the healing and joy of all the world. May it be so. Amen.